Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president. And as ever, it is a highlight of our calendar for our semi-annual Global Economic Prospects meeting done under the leadership of Karen Dynan, professor of the practice at Harvard University and non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. Uh, we always try to do this uh, going back many years, previously with Mike Musa or David Stockton, the chair preceding Karen, um, every six months to pull together our forecast from the major economies with input from all our fellows, a special focus on the US, never more so right now than right now, frankly, and some thematic points as well. Um, we are not an investment bank. We are not the IMF or the OECD. So our value added is that we don't have the biased incentives that some financial sector people may have, and we don't have the restrictions that uh, some official sector people have as well as the fact that our people are genuinely quite good at this. Um, and so we hope to bring you today a look at really scenarios, not just forecasts for the US economy and by extension, the major economies going forward, as Karen will explain, and I think it's obvious, but her way of operationalizing it is not. There's a great deal of uncertainty at the conjunction of public health, popular reaction and public policy. But we're going to have, as always, three speakers on the record, a lively discussion with the Zoom registered participants, and all of this, including the background materials of our panelists, will be available on the PIE website. And we are out ahead of the IMF World Economic Outlook, so they, we can compare. Um, just to recap, speaking first will be Karen Dynan. Again, Karen is professor of practice jointly at Harvard Kennedy School in the Department of Economics at Harvard, as well as a non-resident senior fellow at PIAE. Um, she previously had been Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and therefore Chief Economist of the U.S. Treasury in the second term of the Obama administration. She will be followed by our colleague Jason Furman, who is professor of the practice of economic policy jointly at the Kennedy School and Department of Economics at Harvard. And for you real econ geeks now, is the co-teacher of EC10, the introductory economics course at Harvard College now. Um, Jason was, of course, in several roles in both the, the Clinton and Obama administrations, ending up as the chair of Obama's Council of Economic Advisors in the, in the last term. Uh, Karen will be focused on the outlook for the overall economies in the U.S. Jason will be focusing on some of the responses to stimulus policy, comparisons between EU and U.S. stimulus, and what the lack of stimulus agreement is likely to have impact on the U.S. Finally, uh, speaking will be David Wilcox, who's now with us, I think, a year and a half as a senior fellow at PIE, formerly director of Division of Research and Statistics at the Federal Reserve Board for many years, and therefore the most important forecaster in the U.S. Um, also, he had served at the Treasury and the Clinton administration in the same role. Um, David is particularly interested these days, or is able to express his interest these days in the distributional impact of economic outcomes and business cycles. And he will be taking us through what is really happening distributionally in the US as a result of this cycle, um, especially the implications of that for going forward. Uh, I am available, but meant to be silent beyond this, except calling on my colleagues to speak. Karen, and if necessary, I can provide more information on our outlook for some of the other major economies. But again, today we are choosing to focus on the US as representing the challenges for all the major economies right now. Karen, over to you, please. Thank you, Adam. I'm gonna share some slides. Um, I will start by saying um, that um, I was asked this morning, you know, what's the, the point of forecasting when there's so much uncertainty out there? And, and I would agree that there's an enormous amount of uncertainty out there, not as much as when we did this exercise last spring, but much more than would normally be the case. And as Adam said, I'm gonna to speak to this uncertainty by showing some alternative scenarios later in the presentation. But I would say notwithstanding that uncertainty, I think we can say that some outcomes are more likely than others and that thinking through which outcomes are the most likely is useful for planning and making economic policy. So um, with that in mind, um, let me start with my baseline forecast for the major global economies. Uh, these lines represent levels of real output 
uh, benchmark such that everyone's 2019 levels equal 100. So in terms of common patterns, all economies showed a deep plunge in, in activity last spring, which is showing through in, in all cases, except China, which I'll come to, as a substantial decline in real GDP in 2020, and all economies are in recovery now. Um, nearly all countries have put in place major fiscal and monetary measures to limit the damage, and Jason will be talking about the fiscal measures in much more depth later in the event. Um, countries have done, of course, different things in terms of health policy and have had different underlying conditions going into the crisis, and that is producing uh, different outcomes in terms of the recovery. So for the United States, I expect a close to 4% decline this year, followed by a rebound that will push uh, real GDP above its previous peak by the end of next year. And as Adam said, I'm going to do a deeper dive in the United States later in my talk. Um, Europe has seen a, a deeper decline, uh, and it went into the crisis slightly weaker. It has more trade exposure. Um, some countries are being held back by a resurgence of the virus. So all told, this adds up to a somewhat slower recovery than in the United States. But my baseline expectation is that European GDP will surpass its previous peak in 2021. Um, Japan has done better with the disease, but that's not translating into better economic outcomes, largely because they have a big, small and median enterprise sector, which has seen fallout from the pandemic and a lot of exposure to the plunge we've seen in global trade. Uh, and for the UK, as people probably know, uh, the news of, about Brexit has not been good in recent weeks, uh, meaning that there's a much higher chance of a kind of messy, worse outcome uh, there that will weigh on the recovery in the UK. Okay. Um, oops. So um, just a few more of the major economies. Um, China is a... Um, what I'll call a bright-ish spot. Um, we think they'll see 3% growth this year, um, but remember that 3% is well below trend for China. Um, but basically the news has been um, good in recent months, uh, and it's looking like the recovery in China is uh, much less fragile than we thought it might be last spring. Uh, India, of course, has been hit very hard by the virus, and that's weighing on the recovery there. Uh, Russia, which was not growing particularly robustly before the crisis, has been hit hard because of its dependence on oil. And uh, as for Brazil, we were bearish about the underlying structural issues in Brazil prior to the pandemic, and we continue to be so, and that's weighing on the recovery there. Okay, so that's my quick tour of the global economy. Um, let me go now to a deeper dive on the United States, okay? So um, there are important and concerning distributional issues that underlie what is going on in the aggregate, and David Wilcox will talk about that later in the event. But in the aggregate, the news has basically been better than we expected in recent months. And the early phases of the recovery have been characterized by a strong rebound in aggregate demand. Uh, this slide shows a couple of the factors that are driving this rebound. You can see that wealth has risen. The S&P 500 is up more than 5% on the year. Um, the gains in income fostered in large part by aggressive fiscal policy as well as the period um, when spending was curtailed by the shutdown that's left the personal saving rate um, double its average over the past decade. Uh, and this, these, these factors leave um, the fortunate consumers with great wherewithal to spend at this point. Um, this shows a, you know, a couple of particular categories of spending. Um, I will say that for an economy with an almost 8% unemployment rate, we are seeing um, what I think are very strong levels of spending on big ticket items like homes and cars. Again, this is in the aggregate. Um, we think this is driven by the income and wealth gains that I just discussed, but also low interest rates are playing a role 
as well as um, the fact that there's just a lot of pent up demand out there right now. And um, this demand looks like it's been encouraging enough for, for business owners. And again, I mean, the fortunate business owners that have made it through the worst patch, um, but it's been encouraging for them. If you look at um, core durable goods orders, they're at their highest level now in years. So firms feel confident replenishing their inventories. Um, and we are seeing um, some surprisingly um, strong rates of applications to file, uh, filed to create new businesses. And um, this take on aggregate demand, I think it's consistent with what we're seeing with inflation. Inflation, inflation has been uneven across categories, uh, you know, and the unevenness maps to kind of the, what's going on with demand for different categories. Um, but basically inflation cratered for a bit in a way that you might've found very concerning, um, but basically it's come back to its pre-pandemic levels and it's, uh, uh, at least expectations have stabilized there. So um, not, not too low, um, but not evidence uh, of any spiking inflation as well. All right, so um, that's the good news I have for you. Let me get to a couple of really important caveats. So first of all, this is a partial recovery only. You can see uh, in the panel on the left in this chart um, that the US economy has created or recreated millions of jobs in the last few months. Um, and that's, that's really good news. But you can also see in this chart that we're only about halfway out of the hole that we fell in. Okay, so that's your first caveat. Second caveat, um, and this one is super important as well, um, the pace of recovery has slowed way down, okay? So this is why the title of my talk is, it gets harder from here, okay? We saw 5 million jobs created in June, but only 660,000 jobs created in September. That's a big gain relative to a normal economy, but it's not a big gain when you consider the fact that we're down more than 10 million jobs. Um, third caveat, the recovery is very uneven, okay, which along with the uncertainty about the virus and policy is making it a fragile recovery. So you can see um, in the panel on the left that um, kind of the, the timing of uh, the plunge in aggregate demand and the recovery, it is similar across states. The national total is shown in blue in terms of consumer spending and the lighter lines are all the 50 states. Okay, but you do see variance across states in terms of how much recovery they've made. Um, and then of course, we've seen very big differences in terms of the hit taken and the recovery seen uh, in different uh, you know, categories of industry as well as um, you know, large businesses versus small businesses. Um, but uh, there's a big variance in the degree to which um, jobs compare to their levels pre-pandemic. So, um, you know, the good news plus my caveats, this all leads to my baseline forecast, uh, which you can see on this slide. Um, my baseline forecast calls for a much more typical path of recovery going forward. So based on the monthly data we've seen so far for the third quarter, we think real GDP in the third quarter, that growth is gonna come in somewhere between 25 and 35%. Okay, but after that, I'm forecasting that real GDP growth is going to settle down to the 4% to 3% range. And the unemployment rate, um, it came way down from the high of close to 15% that we saw in April. It's done that already, okay? But the fourth quarter average for this year that I'm projecting of 7.3%, it's only about half a percentage point below where we are now. And from here, we think the unemployment rate will gradually drift down to about 6% by the end of 2021. And this moderate pace of improvement will deliver only a modest increase in inflation over the next year. Okay, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's helpful to think about kind of the decline together with the increase and where that leaves us in the end. 
And so here I'm showing you the path of real GDP. And you can see that all told this baseline forecast leaves the, revel, the level of real GDP um, three percentage points or 3% below where it would have been in the absence of the pandemic by the end of next year. So what I've done here is pretty simple. The blue line just extrapolates out uh, where we were at the end of last year with what we had been thinking was the growth rate of potential output, 1.8%, okay? And so you can see we end up 3% below that with my baseline forecast. Um, important note here, don't mistake the gap that I'm showing here for the current output gap, okay? An important uh, point uh, for thinking about where we're going from here is that um, uh, the pandemic is changing potential output, okay? So um, some of the gap uh, that I showed you on, uh, on the last chart, it's a shortfall relative to potential output, but some is a reduction in potential output meaning what the supply side of the economy can produce. And this chart shows you roughly what might be going on with potential output right now with the orange line. I will emphasize this is not a scientific estimate. It's just a really a sketch to help you think about what's going on. Um, but the point you can see here is that uh, kind of the, the new normal in terms of potential output supply in the economy um, we think it's um, likely by the end of this projection period to be below the old normal, I'll tell you why in a minute, um, by something that's probably going to be measured in uh, percentage points, not tenths of a percentage point. Okay, so this table basically um, shows you why we think this is the case. Uh, let's think about what's going on with the supply side. So in the short term, um, Supply has been constrained by business shutdowns and COVID sen sensitive sectors. Um, over the median run, we should expect, I'm sorry about that, supply to be constrained by the need for sectoral reallocation, the, re the need for new businesses to build the organizational capital that old businesses lost when they failed, maybe a debt overhang. And over the longer run, supply will be constrained by a lower private and public capital stock and less skill development. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about is uncertainty around the forecast. Okay, as I said before, there are similarities and differences in countries' responses so far, and we've seen considerably different economic outcomes. Okay, and the uncertainty around macro policy, around health policy, around the extent of long-term damage, that all is going to matter. That's all creating uncertainty um, that kind of bears on where we're gonna go from here. So I think there's an upside scenario, okay? Um, if you think about my baseline as kind of the, the median expected outcome, Okay, when I'm thinking about the upside, I'm thinking of the median of the possibilities that are better than baseline. Um, but basically I think there's an upside scenario in which we have an effective vaccine pretty soon. We have high take up of that vaccine. We have a large amount of fiscal stimulus. Uh, we have limited scarring. Okay, so that's my upside scenario. Um, in this scenario, uh, you get, um, uh, down to a 5% unemployment rate by the end of next year, okay, instead of the 6% in baseline. So not back to full employment, but closer to full employment. Um, the downside scenario is kind of the opposite of this, okay, a worse experience with the virus and with the vaccine, um, really kind of just little fiscal policy support, um, scarring, um, having an impact on the economy, particularly as we see um, the effects of fiscal stimulus fading uh, and households and businesses become more vulnerable. Um, so um, this scenario um, involves the unemployment rate um, going up a bit from where, where it is from here and then kind of just really stalling out, okay? Um, so you'll notice if you look, I've got both the upside and downside uh, on this graph. Um, and you can see uh, that there's an asymmetry 
I think that's an accurate uh, portrayal of the fact that the range of downside outcomes is larger. Um, the What I view is kind of the median downside outcome is something that is a stalling out of the economy, but certainly there's a lower tail that could be uh, much worse. So um, I, I, I put a, a non-trivial uh, weight on the possibility of um, certainly a, a quarter of negative GDP, uh, but also on a double dip that is uh, more sustained. So um, that's all I have to say. And with that, I am going to turn things back to Adam. Thank you very much, Karen. Obviously a huge amount to go through and thank you for setting out why we still do the forecasting exercise even as uncertainty rises. Jason, can you take us through your deeper dive on fiscal policy? Obviously you've been writing some great stuff about that. So thank you for talking us through it. Uh, thanks so much for um, including me and that great discussion by Karen. I am gonna talk today about um, two parts of this. I'm gonna start with fiscal policy from an aggregate demand perspective, um, talk about the initial fiscal response and the current non-response. Then I'm gonna to get to two labor market policy debates, more microeconomic issues underlying all of this, and then finally talk about where we are in terms of the future of fiscal policy. Broadly speaking, I think the narrative and very consistent with what Karen said is we had an absolutely historic shock hit the economy. Nothing ever as big as shutting down large fractions of the economy for a sustained period on a global scale. Huge negative thing. At the same time, we had a huge positive thing happen to the economy, um, and that is the fiscal stimulus that we did. The fiscal stimulus um, was about 12% of GDP. 2010, um, was the previous record holder. This actually is larger 2010 than anything we did to fight the Great uh, Depression. It was only 3% of GDP. So this is unprecedented as a response to an economic event. If you want a parallel, you have to look to World War II and the amount we did there. The combination of the biggest shock we ever had with the biggest policy response we ever had leaves the economy in a recession that is reasonably bad recession, but actually not a recession for history, the history books. April will be a month for the history books, but this two year period um, will not be the most distinctive and worst economic event of the post-war period. Um, the financial crisis and the 1980s were worse than that um, because of this response. Some uncertainty about that in terms of the response that's coming, the health developments, um, and I'll get to that. Um, just to put the United States, which is what I was just showing you in context, um, Germany has a similarly large response. In general, in the Euro area, the response was smaller. Um, Japan hasn't done nearly as much on um, fiscal policy. Partly this reflects the different fiscal space um, in different countries based on the positions they went into it. In part, it reflects different policy choices. Um, there's some uncertainty in these com comparisons. You know, how do you score loans? How do you score central bank actions? What if they do or don't lose money? So I wouldn't go completely to the mat on this, especially when countries are continuing to do more. Um, but broadly speaking, to a first approximation, everyone has done a lot. To a second approximation, the United States and Germany have done more. This has resulted um, in something that's consistent with what Karen showed you. She showed you this in a different way. This just utterly remarkable um, development. GDP fell in the first quarter. GDP fell by the most it's ever fallen in the second quarter. But then you look at the income that households actually have, real disposable personal income. So this is your income after you pay your taxes, get your transfers, went up a little bit in the first quarter, and it went up by a historic amount in um, the second quarter. What is um, amazing is that was so large, and this is as a result of the unemployment insurance, the checks, and PPP in the CARES Act, it was so large, that rise in disposable personal income, that even without additional stimulus this year, real disposable personal income will rise by more than any year 
since at least 1998, it might rise by more year than any year since 1984. If you look at averages um, for different income classes, this increase has actually been larger at the bottom than at the top. The shock itself was very regressive. Um, that's a point that David is gonna take you through. The policy response was very progressive. UI means a lot, $600 a week means a lot more to people at the bottom than at the top. The checks phased out at the top, um, et cetera. So as a result, sorry, in aggregate, um, we, see, we see this remarkable um, fact that retail sales make a V-shaped um, recovery, um, real retail and food sales. Compare that to what we saw in um, the financial crisis where it just continued falling um, and fell by you know, 12%, now it's gone up. So this is because of um, the large policy response. As I was saying, regressive shock, progressive policy response, the net effect of those two, according to my colleagues um, here at Harvard at Opportunity Insights, is that in low income zip codes, consumption never fell by as much and fully recovered. In high income zip codes, consumption fell by more and still um, hasn't recovered. Now these are averages that put buckets on three low income zip codes. In low income, there's enormous heterogeneity. If you got the unemployment insurance, you did quite well. If you weren't eligible for it, um, you did quite badly. And that's, I think, how you square the averages, even for the bottom quintile, look better than the averages for the top quintile. Within the bottom quintile, there's a lot of heterogeneity and um, in some cases, quite a lot of um, suffering. Again, David will talk about it. This is the stimulus that was. Of course, this ended at um, the end of July. The consequence just of ending the aggregate demand associated with the unemployment um, insurance benefits will subtract about 2% from the growth rate in the third quarter. Now remember, when you're talking about a growth rate, the annualized rate, you know, of plus 35, this means it'll be plus 33 instead of plus 35, um, you're not gonna see this in the data. It's a bigger effect in the fourth quarter, but again, the fourth quarter numbers are moving around for such huge reasons that even though this is undoubtedly a negative, not such a big negative um, that it's the difference between positive and negative growth, um, by next year, it might make more of a difference. Um, you can measure it in terms of jobs and you're talking about you know, millions of jobs different in terms of the amount of the demand. Um, but again, you know, minus two is not the difference between a growing and a contracting economy when the rebound is, um, is so fast. Um, state and local, here I'm relying on a new paper by Auerbach, Gale, um, I think Lutz also, sorry, forgotten author of the paper, and um, Louise Shiner. Um, they did really painstaking analysis of state and local shortfall. Um, and these are their annual numbers. Um, state aid in 2020 exceeded the revenue shortfall. Now there's still additional demands on spending and in future years, there's very little state aid. So there's a big shortfall coming. But I think some of this explains some of the timing in terms of the expiration of UI, not a massive effect right away because households built up their balance sheets and were able to spend down from their savings accounts. State and local also not a massive effect right away because there is a lot of upfront assistance. In both cases, we're more worried what's gonna happen with UI as people run out of money um, with states and localities as they start preparing their budgets um, for next year. So just briefly, um, and we can do this more in the Q&A, um, in thinking about stimulus now, you know, when do we need it is one question. Simple, two months ago. How long does it need to last as long as it takes? Um, Karen shows we still have an output gap at the end of 2021. We still have interest rates at zero at the end of 2021. So I think we're still gonna need fiscal support into the year 2022. If you do triggers, you can make sure it lasts as long as possible. Um, how much? 
I like to think of it per month. It's hard to compare stimulus numbers when you're looking at bills that are different periods. Um, it depends on what you think the output gap is. It depends on what you think the multiplier is. Um, that exercise can get you as high as 270 if you think a 10% output gap and a 0.5 multiplier. Also do a bottom up, which basically asks, what do you need to do to protect the states? What do you need to do to protect people's incomes? What do you need to do to respond to the health emergency? I get a number like 235 billion. Um, what this says is if you're legislating for a six month period, 1.2 trillion is enough to fill the output gap with your multiplier at 0 0.5 is enough to basically protect people um, pretty fully. Specific um, policy composition of all of this. Um, there's a lot of different things one could discuss. I'm just gonna do two that have gotten um, a lot of discussion. The first is for unemployment insurance. Do you want to have the US model where a worker is furloughed, they get benefits from the government and the business doesn't need to pay them. And that's a replacement rate that was more than 100%. Now it's 50%. Or do you want the European model? The furloughed workers continue to be on the payroll. They get a check from the government. In many cases, actually, they got less than 100%. The European scheme was much less generous before um, of course, it's more generous now. And then the businesses are partially or fully reimbursed by the government for those expenses. I'd say there's an awful lot of commentary about the superiority of the European model that the United States has prevented mass, you know, chosen mass unemployment, Europe has prevented it. I think to a first approximation, the two systems are much more similar than people have said. In both cases, if you're not working, you get money. In both cases, employers have little or no cost. In both cases, if an employer returns to economic viability, they'll reactivate their employees. And in both, if they're not viable, they can't. You know, if you're a movie theater in the United States and you can reopen and get customers, you're not gonna stay closed because you can't find your old employees or can't find new ones. If movie theaters can be in business in July of next year, they will be in business and they will employ people whether or not you had UI or job retention. Conversely, if movie theaters can't reopen in Europe, they're not going to employ people whether or not they have um, retention schemes. There are some differences. Um, the US system is a bit of a lower cost for employers, which will help them return to viability. Um, but the European system is less disruptive for employees. The administration in many US states was a disaster. The US system, technically, if you refuse to go back to work, you lose your UI. But that requires the employer to report you in the state to do something about it. And that is inconsistent across employers and across states. So in the United States, actually, you have more ability for an employee to say, you know what, I'm not going back to work. I'd like to stay on UI. In Europe, if your employer tells you you need to come back to work, you need to come back to work. Because if you don't come back to work, you're not getting a check. So the US one actually is more leverage for employees that comes with their greater disruption. Finally, the US one handles reallocation better because the benefit is attached to the individual. It leaves them free to find any other job. Um, I think it is possible the European system has higher job attachment, um, but I think that's been greatly overstated the magnitude and importance of that. Um, the reason it's been greatly overstated is in the US, when you're furloughed, you are continue to be an employee. You continue to be on payroll. It's just zero hours and zero wage. If the business reopens, they're going to find you. They're going to be able to bring you back. It's not as if that match is permanently severed. I think this reallocation is really, really important. So overall, I give a slight edge to um, the US approach over the European approach. But most importantly, they're similar, and it depends on how they're implemented. Right now, the U.S. approach of 50% replacement rate, I think, is a disaster, given how many people are unemployed. On the labor market attachment, a lot of people point to graphs like this to say the U.S. has chosen mass unemployment. Um, this graph used to be a lot more stark. It used to be the U.S. looked like that, 
and Europe look more like that. But every month, the unemployment rate goes down in the United States. Every month, the unemployment rate goes up in the United States. They've been converging. Uh, most importantly, the US number includes temporary layoff as unemployed. In most of the other countries here, if you're temporary layoff, you're not counted as unemployed. If you take out the temporary layoff people, um, the United States looks quite similar to others. And it's extremely likely that in the month of September, the unemployment rate in the United States is lower, was lower than it was in Europe and almost certainly lower than it was in the Euro area. Um, they've just done their numbers for August, not September. So our unemployment rate was a lot higher than them. They keep rising, um, we keep falling. Second one, just to do it quickly, $600 a week for unemployment insurance. Been a big debate in the United States. Just the facts, at $600 a week, um, the typical worker is getting 50% more from unemployment than they were from their job. Um, about a quarter of workers were getting twice as much from unemployment um, on their job. In theory, this increases consumer spending, which is good for economy. In theory, it reduces labor supply, which is bad for the economy. The evidence on the spending increase, this is from the JP Morgan Chase Institute, Peter Ganon, Pascal Noel, and others, um, is overwhelming. In fact, to some degree, we overshot the mark of consumption smoothing because people who received benefits in April and July increased their spending by 10% above their um, previous thing. Now, remember, their income went up about 50%, their spending went up about 10%, so their savings went up, but they actually were consuming at a higher rate um, than they were before because their incomes were so much higher than they were before. So the spending effect is quite large. Um, this is a confusing picture. It's from a paper by Abonia Washington and co-authors at Yale. Uh, basically, they're trying to say the employment disincentives that you don't see a clear evidence with different replacement rates, the employment before and after is similar. I wouldn't take this too far. It's hard to do an event study around this. The month of April is very different from other months. Um, so I don't think the April-May evidence is quite as clear as some researchers have said, have said it is um, because there's a lot of stuff not being controlled for. A lot of workers may have expected the 600 not to be continued. If you continued it, their expectations might have changed. And I think most important, if you thought $600 was the right number for April, I'm not sure you should think it's the right number for December. Personally, I think a number more like 400 strikes a reasonable balance. It would still, for most workers, give them a replacement rate above 100%. And a lot of the hunger and suffering we've seen is not tied to people not getting the magnitude of the UI, it's people not getting UI at all. So things like nutritional assistance are really important. Um, we'll end on the future of fiscal policy. I think almost no serious person is worried about deficits and debt at this current second. You know, I think everyone recognizes a big fiscal response is important. You know, Janet Yellen to Greg Mankiw across the spectrum. The bigger issue is how worried should we be about the medium term? How urgent is deficit reduction? You see debt is gonna rise above 100% of GDP in four of the G7 economies. Uh, this year. Um, two of them were already there. France and the United States are joining the 100% plus club. The debt to GDP, though, misses something um, really important. Debt is a stock and it's backward looking. GDP is a flow. The net present value of US GDP, according to the Social Security trustees, is four quadrillion dollars. I think that's the largest number that's ever been discussed at the Peterson Institute, um, except for this number, infinity is even bigger if you think R is less than G. So you have an enormous set of resources to pay off your debt. It only requires a tiny tax on the entire future to repay um, the debt. Really important in all of this is the interest rate. Um, and as we know, interest rates have been falling. This isn't just a post-crisis phenomenon. They were falling before the financial crisis. They were low even at full employment or near full employment in 2019, and they're lower still now. Our way we think of fiscal policy has to reflect this lowering of interest rates. 
Um, you see something remarkable in the United States. You see similar things elsewhere, which is that in the United States, the debt is increasing every year for the next many years. But at the same time, interest payments on the debt, these are shown on a different scale, of course, um, are falling every year. Oops. Falling every year for um, the next several years. Interest payments on the debt are a flow compared to a flow. They're a better measure of what is displaced in real terms um, by fiscal policy and are giving us a relatively reassuring picture. Um, we see debt service has trended down um, across the advanced economies and is relatively low across um, the advanced economies. And CBO has revised its forecast to say in some sense, we should be even less worried about debt service than we used to be. Um, this is looking at real net interest payments, which adjust for the fact that some of our debt is inflated away every year, which is the analytically correct thing to do. Um, before COVID, the blue line, CBO expected interest payments to be relatively low as a share of GDP. Post COVID, CBO revised down and is actually now much more optimistic about our fiscal position. We have much more fiscal space than we used to have with interest payments being, real interest payments being negative. If I showed you nominal, you'd see a similar, uh, it would be above zero, of course, um, but you'd see a very similar story among the most favorable interest as a share of GDP um, that we have had in nominal terms um, as well. I'm only showing you at five years. If you look out um, 10 years, this does start to rise and we do need to make some sort of adjustment. Otherwise it will keep rising forever. Um, how big an adjustment depends on two things. It depends on what is your view of the difference between the growth rate and the interest rate. I think this is the base case. It's something like growth rates are 1.5 higher than interest rates. But you know, we could be pessimistic and say growth rates are gonna be half a point below. The second thing it depends on is what do you want your debt to be? Do you want it to stabilize at 75, stabilize at 150, stabilize at 250? I'll just take one target, which I think is reasonable for the United States. I think probably too high for a smaller country, especially a Euro area country that is not borrowing its own currency. But you think G minus R is going to be 1.5, you're comfortable with debt at 150, then you need your primary deficit to get to 2.2% of GDP. The United States is exceeding that prior to the crisis projected to. So it has a fiscal adjustment of about 2% of GDP if you look forward that it would need to make. Um, most other countries are already consistent with stabilizing their debt at a place that's better than 150% um, percent of GDP. Um, how do we pick? Do we want 75? Do we want 150? Do we want 250? Um, I will now close by leaving you with my answer to that question. Um, no one knows the answer to that. To some degree, it depends on why you have the debt you have. To some degree, it depends on what other countries do. It depends on what financial markets think. For now, my head is anchored at 150 for the US, um, but I'm very, very open to other ways um, to think about that and look forward to continuing to discuss this. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, we are accumulating a great list of questions from our participants and I'm very conscious of time. So let me move on directly to David, please. And then I will do a lightning round of channeling the participants' questions to our speakers. David, thank you. Thank you. It's very good to be here today. Um, I'm going to uh, dovetail actually quite nicely with the discussion that was provided by Karen and uh, Jason. Uh, and I'd like to step away from the headlines of the past uh, day or two about whether there will be 
uh, continued fiscal negotiations, whether they're on again or off again, whether it's a, a broad package or a narrow package. And instead, I'd like to focus on a question that I think will have um, some enduring importance, uh, regardless of the outcome of the discussions between the administration and uh, the Congress over the next couple of days. Namely, uh, the question is why have uh, fiscal negotiations stalled uh, thus far, despite the fact that as Jason reviewed, in many respects, the boost that was provided by the CARES Act uh, is fading away. As uh, we know, the $600 federal unemployment insurance supplement uh, expired over two months ago at the end of July. There's been no renewal of re relief payments of $1,200 per adult or $500 per child. Uh, the remaining proceeds from the PPP loans uh, paid out to small businesses are rapidly dwindling. And all this, of course, is happening long before the uh, virus itself has been brought under control. Um, to some degree, the absence of a, a replacement fiscal package is a question for uh, political scientists attempting to understand the motivations of fiscal policymakers, but it's relevant for our discussion today, both because the answer tells us something about the unique nature of the current economic downturn, and because it tells us about the outlook that Karen and Jason have discussed. I don't have complete uh, answers to the question of why the fiscal negotiations have stalled, but I do have uh, two partial answers. Uh, first, as uh, Jason particularly suggested, uh, the CARES Act was so massive that it succeeded to a degree in cushioning households from the financial impact of the sharpest increase in unemployment since the Great Depression, which is a remarkable accomplishment and worth noting. Uh, second, that's not the whole answer. We know for sure that in many respects, households continue to endure uh, severe hardships that are well within the capability of fiscal policy to address. But importantly, those hardships are concentrated in some ways that are quite atypical, in some ways that are typical of a recession, but also in some ways that are unprecedented. Uh, this chart, uh, shows another perspective on the success of the CARES Act at the aggregate level. The blue line uh, shows real disposable income index so that it's equal to 100 in February. And as Jason suggested, the CARES Act was so massive that it accomplished the remarkable achievement of boosting, ensuring that personal income has remained uh, ever since, in the six months or so since uh, the coronavirus shutdown, personal income has remained above its February level. That despite the fact that, as uh, has been noted earlier, the economy cratered uh, pretty severely, and that includes household spending. Um, but a second uh, answer, I think, is not that just the job has been done, we can uh, rest easy. We know that the employment uh, impact of the uh, coronavirus shutdown was extraordinarily severe. The red line in this graph compares uh, the employment decline from the business cycle peak in February over through to uh, through September and shows that the initial decline was really extraordinary, that more jobs were lost just in the early months of the collapse than cumulatively over the whole of the so-called Great Recession, which we may need to relabel. The Great Recession is shown by the green dots. And it's interesting, by the way, to note that uh, the job loss in the Great Recession emerged only over the course of uh, two, two years or so. The profile, obviously, of this collapse is vastly different, much sharper in the early going, and uh, a, a, a more pronounced uh, rebound right away. Uh, but what has marked this experience as really different is that uh, the differentiation is very sharp by income class. The bottom right panel here, the one labeled coronavirus, shows uh, per results that were published in the Washington Post uh, earlier, and I'm using by kind permission from the Washington Post, 
the purple line shows that employment uh, in the lowest earning quartile of wages remains more than 20% uh, below its uh, February level. Meanwhile, employment at the top uh, 25% of the wage uh, normal income distribution has fully returned to its pre-crisis uh, level. So the experience of this recession at the top of the income ladder is just qualitatively different than it is at the bottom. And as you can see, the two uh, quartiles that are mostly grayed out are uh, undergoing an intermediate version of the experience. So this is one really key difference in, the, uh, in this recession relative to the other, and it shows a concentration of the hardship uh, in the lowest earning quartile of wages. Another respect in which this experience has been just extraordinary is food insecurity. This is uh, documented uh, importantly by the Pulse Survey conducted by the Census Bureau. Food insecurity has roughly doubled since uh, before the COVID uh, shutdown and has reached levels uh, that are much higher than were attained in the Great Recession. Um, as you can see here, this used by permission of uh, Bittler, Hoynes, and Schanzenbach. Uh, and what you can see here quite distressingly is that food insecurity is much greater among families uh, that have children. Uh, it's high enough to be sure among households without children or among, among all households. But the fact that something like through the summer, something like 30% of, of households with children were suffering food insecurity is really quite uh, worrisome. Um, another uh, respect in which the economic pain of this downturn has been concentrated has been the differentiation in the labor market uh, by race and ethnicity. Uh, this chart uh, shows uh, a, a the results of a statistical exercise that attempts to uh, extract the component of unemployment rates that cannot be accounted for uh, by individual characteristics such as age, educational attainment, and marital status. And so presumptively, uh, this component of unemployment reflects uh, discrimination. It may well be an understatement of the effect of uh, discrimination because, for example, educational attainment itself may well reflect uh, discrimination. But what we see here is that in 2019, the uh, the presumptively discriminatory component of the African-American male unemployment rate shown by the blue line had reached a historic low. In the early part of 2020, we've seen that uh, turn back up as the overall labor market uh, collapsed. And we see a similar, albeit smaller, uh, upturn in the dis presumptively discrimination component of the unemployment rate for uh, black women. This deterioration by race and ethnicity, um, cruelly enough, may have been muted by the fact that African Americans are overrepresented in so-called essential occupations. And so despite the fact that they have endured an increase in discrimination, they may also have been putting themselves at greater health risk uh, at the same time. This chart shows the comparable results for Latinx uh, workers. And here we see that the uh, upturn in the presumptively discrimination uh, component uh, is larger in this episode uh, than for African-Americans. These two charts come from work that I'm doing jointly at the moment with some former colleagues at the Federal Reserve Board, Tomas Steiner, uh, David Ratner, and Ivan Vidangos. Now, what does all this mean for the outlook? I think in the near term, uh, a, a, a conclusion that I arrive at reluctantly is that the stalling out of the fiscal uh, negotiations may well reflect importantly the phenomenon that the hardship that is being experienced is not being experienced by political decision makers nor pr presumably predominantly by participants in this call. And that's of great concern. It has the near-term implication that the, uh, as Karen documented, the, the recovery has already lost momentum and the delay every day that it delays uh, 
uh, a next fiscal package being enacted will slow the recovery further. This is particularly dangerous and concerning at a moment when the Fed has already expended most, not all, but most of its ammunition and really is not in a position to provide a material further boost to economic activity. In the longer term, uh, the effects for um, our, our conventional economic uh, aggregates may be quite subtle. They may be quite hard to detect. A, a rather durable finding in the United States is that there's not much evidence of labor market scarring from past recessions. As Jason has suggested, if things continue on track as projected here, uh, it may well be that the COVID collapse of 2020 is relatively mild, hard as that is to believe compared to earlier recessions. However, I, I, I really strongly caution against taking too much comfort from that because we don't know what the long-term effects will be of concentrated hunger, of disparate health impacts by race and ethnicity, of localized uh, incidents of adverse health effects, of dramatically different access to uh, educational resources and what seem almost sure to be widening attainment, educational attainment gaps uh, across major demographic groups. And with that, I will yield the floor. Thank you, David. And we, speaking for Peterson and this audience, look forward to your research actually fleshing out those last points. How do we know and how much the scarring and how it works? We have received 22 questions, which are all almost all, very, very good. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna to try to push through a bunch of them quickly. So I'm gonna read off ones for Karen, for Jason, and for David, and then ask each of them to respond. Uh, for Karen from Vikram Nehru, what are your labor force participation assumptions for the US that underlies your forecast? And how much is that the difference between the, the, the good and the bad forecasts as opposed to say health. I shouldn't say good and bad, the positive and negative scenarios. For Jason, two questions. One from Kevin Mooring. Um, in your 2016 paper, New Approach to Fiscal Policy or whatever it was called, um, you talked about fiscal stimulus potentially crowding in investment and activity. Do you see that as a possibility here? Is that a relevant point? And from Steve Cicchetti, okay, um, he didn't say this, but I'll say, despite your shrug on the last slide, um, are you really indifferent between the levels of debt? In particular, are you worried about the risk of fiscal dominance when monetary policy is so flat right now? And then finally to David from Gene Frieda, you say the Fed is out of the ammo, and, and so what should it be doing, if anything, at this point beyond talking about fiscal policy? Um, okay, so Karen, first to you. Um, sure. Um, labor force participation, uh, that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, I like to look at um, kind of prime age labor force participation. So you abstract from patterns related to uh, the baby boom retiring, but labor force participation, as one might have expected, has fallen quite a bit among the prime age group from 83% uh, percent in January, which was a, a hot, you know, a, a high uh, by historical, by recent historical standards to 81% now. Um, I, in my forecast, I'm building in um, a, a little further drop in the near term because we have um, kind of evidence that, and survey evidence, anecdotal evidence that uh, parents are dropping out of the workforce um, as schools are remaining home and they have uh, bigger responsibilities at home. Um, but um, I do expect this to turn around uh, you know, uh, perhaps um, quickly at first as parents come back in, uh, but then kind of gradually increase much like uh, after the Great Recession. But that is, you know, that increase in labor force participation um, is something that um, keeps my unemployment rate from declining more than it would in the baseline. Um, in terms of the downside risk scenario, I certainly would expect uh, labor force participation, um, any improvement to stall out, same as with the unemployment rate. Um, and um, because of that uh, stalling out, that actually, you know, if it weren't for that stalling out of labor force participation, um, uh, you know, were better, uh, we actually would see a, a bigger rise in the unemployment rate. So it's just a, a piece of kind of bad news that kind of adds on to the bad news I showed in my downside risk scenario. 
Thank you very much, Karen. Jason. Great. Um, one reason fiscal policy can be so effective at a time like this, which I synthesized research on in that new view speech that the first question referred to, is that normally we might worry that rising interest rates due to fiscal policy will crowd out investment. Um, fiscal policy can't increase interest rates. They want to be minus five. Maybe it'll increase that so they want to be minus three. Um, in either case, they'll still actually be zero. Um, so you don't get crowd out. You might get crowd in through two mechanisms. One is if um, fiscal policy raises expected inflation, that lowers the real interest rate. The second is through an accelerator mechanism that businesses invest because they expect the economy to grow more quickly. If you can make the economy grow more quickly, it can lead to more business investment. So right now, fiscal policy um, is likely to be especially um, potent. To um, Steve's question, um, you know, how much can the United States borrow? Um, the United Kingdom borrowed 250% of its GDP to win World War II. The United States borrowed over 100% of our GDP um, and increments much larger than we're doing now to win World War II. Um, many countries around the world have seen more rapid increases um, in debt without a problem than what we're doing right now. The fact that interest rates are so low um, tells me that we're not anywhere close um, to being needing to worry about that question. Um, in terms of fiscal dominance, and I think this is something um, Olivier Blanchard has, has said and talked about, it would require an institutional change at the Fed to make me worried about that. If you have a Fed that has the rules and targets they have now, um, which is an inflation target, it's an average inflation target, it's a wait until you see the whites of its eyes target, um, but it has inflation in it, and we overheat the economy, um, they're going to raise rates um, to deal with that. I think almost any conceivable Fed chair in the mold of the ones we have had um, would um, do that, in which case I wouldn't worry very much about it. In fact, I would say the higher debt is going to give us more room um, to do monetary policy. And if we brought the debt down a lot, equilibrium interest rates would fall and we'd have less space um, on the debt. So I think there is a tail risk of high debt plus a different type of Fed. I think that's a relatively remote tail risk. It's hard to see how that chair would get through. Even if they did, there's all the Reserve Bank presidents to restrain them. Thank you, Jason. David, over to you. Uh, the question to me was what the Fed should do uh, now that it has expended most of its uh, ammunition. I think there are three answers to that. First of all, Congress appropriated a substantial amount of resources in the CARES Act to backstop Federal Reserve programs. The pricing of those programs, I think it's evident, has been quite conservative, intended to ensure that the Treasury took no losses. I don't understand uh, that, that degree of conservatism, and I would encourage the Treasury and the Fed to rethink the pricing of those programs so that taxpayer resources were, are put at risk and some losses are taken in service of promoting a faster recovery. Secondly, the Fed has offered, I think, a significant clarification of forward guidance on rate policy, but hasn't done anything in terms of forward guidance on its large-scale asset purchases. And so I think there's some housekeeping to, to be done there to tidy that up. At the moment, the statement is they intend to continue purchases at, at least their current pace over coming months. I think they can be more aggressive about that. And there is a little more room to bring longer term interest rates down. Thirdly, looking most furthest outside the box and over the longer term, the Fed's job number one is to reattain uh, full employment and 2% inflation. My, my sense, my uh, strong belief is that uh, the 2% inflation objective over the longer term is not appropriate. It may have been fine. I think it was a good place for the Fed to be as of a dozen years ago or so when the groundwork was laid for the adoption of a formal inflation target in today's even lower interest rate environment. It's not adequate. That's going to be difficult to attain for any single central bank. Adam, uh, I think quite insightfully advocated that it might be easier for multiple central banks to raise the inflation target, say to 3% on a coordinated basis. And I think that would be a very good direction to go. The way the Fed could build a bridge to getting there is by articulating in the near term, 
Our job is to get inflation back to 2%. And once that uh, objective is attained, we will revisit the question of the optimal inflation target. Thank you. We're about out of time, if I've gone a bit over. But David, one follow-up question for you from Ann Van Prague. How well do you think the Biden campaign's platform, if adopted, would address the uneven effects of the crisis on hunger, education, health, and so on? Well, uh, okay, the, uh, a key caveat is the if adopted uh, phrase. It matters uh, terribly importantly who ends up controlling uh, the Senate because that will determine whether, if a Biden administration eventuates, whether they will be able to enact uh, their, their program. I think it will make a substantial uh, a progress. Um, there's some basic blocking and tackling here that needs to be done that's really extremely uh, simple. I'll give just one example. Um, the school district in Tucson over the summer, by their own report, was serving 10% as many meals uh, through their school meal program as they had been or would be on a normal basis. It's been di discovered and documented that increasing the allocation of funds to electronic benefit transfer cards is very effective in allowing households to purchase the groceries that they need. This isn't uh, rocket science, and I'm quite confident that uh, in a Biden administration, provided uh, they have something like a cooperative Congress, that a lot of progress will be made in directions like that. Terrific. Thank you, David. Thank you, Jason. And thank you, especially Karen, for coordinating and bringing together our forecasts. Thanks to all our audience with apologies to the 18 or so people whose questions I could not get in in the time allotted. Uh, as always, the slides and links to background materials are posted on the PIE.com website on the event webpage later today or very soon, thanks to the miracle of Zoom, we will have the recordings of today's sessions up and eventually a transcript. We look forward to continued discussion with all our constituents and stakeholders about how we make sense of the world we're facing. I'm grateful to Karen, Karen Dynan, Jason Furman, and David Wilcox for their graceful, insightful efforts to help us all make sense of this. We look forward to seeing you again at the Peterson Institute for International Economics soon. And of course, our next Global Economic Prospects meeting in six months time. For now, this meeting is adjourned.